Welcome to the conversation here at the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director. We're thrilled to be talking with Beth Akers, an illustrious UAlbany graduate with a BS in economics and mathematics. She went on to earn a PhD in economics at Columbia University. At a rather young age, she served as a staff economist on the Council of Economic Advisors in the George W. Bush White House. She's the author of the new book, Making College Pay, An Economist Explains How to Make a Smart Bet on Higher Education. It's a valuable collection of practical advice for students and families who are grappling with tough decisions about how to pay for college. Dr. Akers is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, a leading free market think tank based in Washington, DC, where she focuses on the economics of higher education. She's appeared on ABC News, Bloomberg Television, C-SPAN, and CNBC, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and other leading publications. You can purchase Making College Pay via link to an independent bookseller here on this screen. Beth, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mark. I'm glad to be here. So I'd like to get to the most important question first. Is the University at Albany a smart choice from an economic <laughs> perspective? It sure was for me. <laughs> I think there's a lot of great opportunities that, that are exist for students at SUNY Albany. So I am incredibly grateful to my alma mater for, for the springboard that it provided me. So you're a big believer in the virtues of free markets and private enterprise. Is, is there any paradox in being a supporter of publicly funded higher education? <laughs> Great question. So, you know, I, a lot of my work is actually commenting on policy. That's what I spent most of my career doing. And so with this book, I really stepped back and I said, OK, I'm taking off my policy hat. I want to say, given, given the world that we live in, given the policy regime that exists, how does an individual take advantage to the system of the system to their to their best interest? And so, yes, I do recommend in the book that people go to public institutions. At the same time, I'm on Capitol Hill arguing against further subsidies to community colleges. <laughs> so there is a dissonance there. And actually, it's 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 been kind of fun as a scholar for me to to really grapple with those differences. And, and what it is, is that what's individually rational for people is not the same as what's socially optimal. Um, but everyone out there making decisions about college is not responsible for social optimality. <laughs> They're responsible for making sure they can pay their bills after they graduate. And so that's who this book is for. You poke a bit of fun at your vaguely artsy, unfocused, younger self. Um, is it important and is it even possible for most kids to know what they want out of a college education when they graduate high school? Yeah, great question. Um, I think for a lot of young people at that age, it is too big of an ask to say what it is that you want to do for the rest of your life. Um, what I recommend in the book is that you do have a sense before you go. And I say, you know, it's a lovely thing to go to college and sort of explore the options in front of you, but that's a very expensive and potentially financially risky path. So if you've got the money in the bank and that feels extremely important to you and you want to spend your risk, spend your money on that, then go for it. But if you're a bit more conservative, have more realistic financial constraints, don't have a trust fund or parents who are going to support you if things don't work out, then you probably want to work backwards from an end goal because that's the most reliable path to get there so that you don't end up underwater on your financial investment. So you found your focus uh, very early on and, and you just ran with it. You, were, you fell in love with economics and, and, you, and you never looked back. Not everyone is so fortunate. Do, mm -hmm. do you have any advice for students on, on how to find that motivation or sense of purpose? I think working is not a terrible idea. I mean, I had lots of jobs before I went to school. None of them were especially informative for the future career that I did. But 
I think there's nothing wrong with taking time if you're not quite ready to make that decision and maybe, you know, look at different employment options or volunteer options that give you exposure to different careers. We push everyone into college right after high school. And that's kind of, that goes back to that socially optimal policy thing, because we want more and more people to get educated. But my sense is that for, for many individuals, the best decision is actually to wait and figure out what it is that you want to study. Again, if you've got cash on hand of a trust fund with your name on it, then by all means, go to college and explore. I mean, I had a bit of that luxury. I was able to, to be in college for a year before I really had a sense of where I wanted to go. Um, but if you don't have that, we do, do a disservice to people by encouraging them to go down that path. What, what, are, some of the, what are some of the jobs that you did in, in advance of enrolling in college? Well, or, or I was a long, you were in college. I was a longtime cashier at Home Depot before and during college, where I developed my home improvement skills long before I was able to afford to purchase my own home, but are still relevant to me today. <laughs> I made bagel sandwiches. I worked at another hardware store. Hardware must have been really in my in my blood at that point because I really seemed to work at a lot of hardware stores. <laughs> so you argue that college is romanticized in American pop culture, it's oversold as an intellectually and socially enriching experience. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, college is a romantic notion. I mean, I, I loved college. I stayed in college for as long as I could. I went straight from undergrad to get a PhD. So it's a, it's a bit disingenuous for me to kind of criticize college in this way. But the reality is that that romantic aspect of it, the idea that you can just go and, and follow your passion and, and pick a college based on what feels good to you, that is a really expensive and financially risky way to go. 90% of students who go to college tell us that the reason that they're going is to advance in their career or to make more money. So they're not necessarily interested in this other thing, but we've packaged it all as, as part of the same deal. And I just want consumers to appreciate that you can step back and make these more economically rational decisions. Again, if the mystique of being on a college campus and sitting and sipping espresso with your faculty, if that is what your values are, that's your highest priority, then by all means, go for it. But you got to appreciate that that's an expensive aspect of what education is. And, you know, if, if, if when you look inside yourself and think about what you do really care about, if that's not at the top rank, then you might want to think twice about paying a premium for that. Um, so I think I'm just giving people an option to, to step back and be a bit more practical. Are, are you worried about the fact that some colleges kind of represent themselves as all-inclusive resorts? Well, I'm not worried about it in, in that, you know, if someone has the cash to pay for both the four-year country club experience and an education at the same time, by all means, go and do it. Um, what scares me about that, though, is that we have seemed to confuse the consumption and the investment aspects of education. So part of what you get when you go to higher education is skills, is knowledge, is the credential that gets you higher earnings after you graduate. And then another part of it is the lazy river that's in the campus center and the beautiful quads. That's not delivering anything to your future financially. And so if you can make a choice to attend an institution or a program that doesn't have that, you may be just as well off. So um, the problem is that when we convince lower income students who can't afford those luxuries, that that's the only option for them. And then we push them into that track I think it's really a disservice to, to that group. So was your your time at you all, all that said, what was your time at you Albany socially enriching and intellectually fulfilling? Uh, absolutely. I had a fantastic time when I was there. Like I said, I stayed in school for as long as I possibly could. Um, and so, you know, I, I absolutely appreciate the value that education brings across all dimensions that are not strictly financial. The question you have to ask yourself if you're in this position is how much of that can you afford? There's uh, certainly a sense in higher education that the arts and humanities are under siege. Um, are, are the arts and humanities an important part of a well-rounded education in your view, or, or should they be sacrificed in favor of job-oriented skills? I don't think we need a one-size-fits-all solution here. 
So we have tremendous heterogeneity in our higher education sector in this country. We've got community colleges that focus on job training, that focus on academic staff. We've got, of course, our elite four-year institutions. We've got certificate programs. We've got a bit of everything. And that's great because that means that individuals can choose a program that meets what their needs and what their wants are. So I think the idea is maintain diversity, um, let institutions be all, of all different sorts, um, but inform consumers so that they can appreciate that the first step in the process is thinking about what their own values are, what their own needs are, and empower them with the data to make decisions such that they can optimize that for themselves. Should there be educational standards e even apart from consumer choice? I mean, should it be required that uh, folks get some training and critical thinking and creativity and mathematics and or, or do you think it should all be uh, up, up to the individual consumer? I think it's up to the individual consumer. I don't think that those things will go away and die if we don't promote them from the public sector perspective. Individuals value those things and will continue to support them. Philanthropy will step in and support those things. Um, you know, if everybody were to follow the book, the advice in my book, and, and it turned out that everybody actually was only caring, caring about money, we'd have no humanities majors, we'd have no arts majors tomorrow. But what I imagine in that future world is philanthropy stepping up and saying, we care that there are continuing to be people who can have careers in arts, can have careers in humanities, and we're going to pay for it. Um, and I, I think that's a likely outcome. So you argue that student loans have gotten a bad rap. Um, when do student loans make sense? Student loans make sense when you know you're making a sound investment. So as consumers, we're very comfortable with loans in other aspects of our life. The idea that you can borrow up front to finance something that is going to deliver you benefits long into the future. A lot of us buy cars using loans. The idea is I'm going to have this car for 10 years. I might as well take five years to pay it off. Um, I'm going to live in my house maybe for the rest of my life. So 30 years to pay that back isn't crazy. But we have all gotten terrified of the idea that paying for an education can be based on the same premise. And so as an economist, I'm often raising the point that people typically who take on debt are making a good investment. And because of their access to that debt, they have more wealth, more income from, um, from working in the long run than they would have had otherwise. So people love to say, wouldn't we be better off without all the student debt? Yeah, if you could wait, ma wave a magic wand and get rid of the debt, yes. But what happens if we really get rid of that debt, we also get rid of the degrees. And mathematically, financially, economically, we know that the country will be less well off if that's the case. Individuals have lower income across the board. GDP will be lower because people are less productive. Companies are less productive with the, the less lower levels of, of human capital in the economy. And so a lot of times it's a false comparison. Um, we just certainly have things we need to improve about the federal lending system. Um, it's scary for people to leverage their future without a lot of information about where they're heading. I think we need better safety nets for borrowers so that we don't end up with people who do make a losing bet on college ending up worse off than where they started. And a lot of other little wonky fixes that, that we need. But the premise of borrowing to pay for education, I don't think is a bad one. So, so you, you offer uh, some very sensible advice for, for students and families as they make financial decisions about higher ed going forward. What, what about all of those folks who didn't have the benefit of a book like yours uh, and made bad decisions in the past and are, mm -hmm. are burdened with debt that they can never pay off possibly? Yeah. So if you get your information about student loans from the major newspapers, you probably don't appreciate that there are programs that exist to help you. Um, you know, we often portray student debt as inescapable. Uh, most people know that you can't discharge it in bankruptcy, which is a very scary thing. But over the past 10 years, federal policy has expanded a set of programs called income driven repayment that allow borrowers to make reduced monthly payments that are proportional to how much they're earning. And so if they're earning a low, um, 
low salary or low wages relative to how much they borrowed and how much is due, they can make a reduced payment. And if their income is low enough, they can even re reduce it to zero. That of course delays the time over which you would pay back a loan because interest continues to accumulate. But if you remain in that circumstance of having your loan be unaffordable for you for either 10 or 20 years, depending on which sector you're employed in, you'll have your loans forgiven. So it's not hopeless. These programs aren't great. They're lousy to navigate. Um, they have a lot of administrative challenges, but there could be a lot on the line for somebody who's in that position of having borrowed, um, taking on debt that's really not affordable for where their college put them out into the, into the world. So what about the argument that folks um, who were ignorant or unrealistically optimistic about their future prospects were encouraged to over borrow um, by lenders uh, because they those lenders make more money from those who fail to repay mm -hmm. than those who succeed. Well, we always want to blame Wall Street for everything, but in this, if you believe in the student loan crisis, this is one case where you really cannot. Unfortunately, more than 90% of the debt that's outstanding in the U.S. economy, student debt, is was administered by the federal student loan program, which means that this is a government program that created the debt. So I absolutely agree that we've encouraged people to borrow, to pay without being really a critical, careful consumer, um, but no one's making money off the backs of the these students other than the Department of Education. <laughs> and in fact, they're not. The, the program loses a lot of money each year. Um, and so I think we were misguided for a long time, have been misguided about how we advise students to make decisions about finances for higher education. Um, but we can't blame Wall Street for this one. If your child decided that she or he wanted to be a poet or an anthropologist or a Shakespeare scholar or a filmmaker, would, would you freak out? <laughs> well, I'm sure I would, like, I have to be honest. Um, you know, I think, I think I would have the same goal for my son that I had as, as a student myself, which was, I knew that I needed to be um, financially independent by the time I finished school. That was just an understanding in my family, or at least what I understood the, the rule to be. And so I think if my son chooses to pursue a path like that, I would say that's fantastic. Now you also need a strategy for figuring out how to pay your rent, how to pay your student loans if you're going to take any. Um, and if there's a way to accomplish that through, you know, investment in skills at the same time, maybe in a trade or or a combination of things, I would encourage him to go for it. But um, I, I'm absolutely not going to convince him to take a bet on something that I know statistically is very, very, very unlikely to pay. So many of us. Uh wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning if we weren't doing something that we found interesting or meaningful or, or good for the planet. And, and polling seems to indicate that a, a large, a very large percentage of, of Generation Zers uh, feel this way. What, what would you tell those young people? I absolutely think that's important. So I think a mischaracterization of you know, the advice that I give is that you should go to this college scorecard website that I talk about in the book and just pick out the highest paying school you can get into and pick the highest paying major and just go do that. That's actually not at all what I recommend. Instead, I kind of think of using this, this economic and financial information instead as like a, like a binary sort of thing. So instead of going in and saying, I want to pick the highest major, high, highest paying um, college, I want to say, here are the paths that I'm considering because of my own values, my own preferences, my own um, aptitudes. And when I look forward in the path where that's likely to deliver me in terms of my future earnings opportunity, will I be okay? Will I be able to pay back the amount of debt that it will take me to get through this without having to, to live in poverty? And so the question is, is it enough? Is it okay? Is not a problem of uh, economic maximization, right? Where none of us are really making, well, most of us aren't always making the choices that delivers us to the highest possible earnings that we could ever achieve. Instead, it's, is this enough? And I think that's the way that I would recommend people to think about this. I'm, you know, I don't want anybody to take a path that they believe is affordable for them only to find out later that it's not because they, they didn't look at the data. Um, and so uh, to me, that's the real purpose of making a data-driven decision. 
you bring up some very interesting examples of emerging and disruptive models for, for the future of higher education. Um, and I, I confess that I knew uh, nothing about some of them. Uh, can you talk about college insurance? Sure. So part of the theme, one of the themes of the book is this idea that college is not necessarily too expensive. It's just too risky. So, um, you know, I get in a lot of trouble when I say college is not too expensive because pretty much everyone else agrees that it is. But I say, you know, hey, if it costs Two hundred thousand dollars to go to Harvard, and then you make an extra three million over your career because you hold that degree. That's actually a pretty good deal, and so that's the frame that I'm thinking about it in. So, if risk is the challenge, the great thing about identifying that is that we have solutions for risk in other areas of our lives. So, when things are risky, like owning a home or driving a car, we have created insurance to take the risk off the individual and put it onto a financial financial institution that is better suited to manage that risk. So the same thing is beginning to happen in higher education. So first, the income driven repayment program offers some risk protection for federal loans. Um, and then the other side is for the, for the remaining financing to the extent that it's financed by the private uh, market. There are other solutions like actually buying straight up college insurance, which is a very new option. Option, um, income share agreements, which are an alternative to borrowing. So instead of saying, okay, I need to borrow $10,000 for college, and that means I'm going to make fixed monthly payments of this for 10 years, I say, okay, give me that $10,000. And instead, I'll pay you back 3% of my salary for five years. Um, and so basically, it's a way of paying back in proportion to how much you get from your degree. It kind of ties the value of the degree to the amount that you pay, which is actually quite clever. Um, so there's a lot of new tools in the marketplace like this. Um, they're, they're not plentiful. Most students are not going to encounter them as options at the financial aid office that they walk into. But if someone is particularly risk averse, I do recommend it could be worth um, seeking out a program that does offer these. And I also think it's the future. So I, I expect that we have a lot more institutions offering the sort of guarantees um, that would be really satisfying to young people and their parents. Can you tell us about you experience? It, it, it sounds it sounds pretty dystopian and extremely disruptive and uh, and intriguing, but uh, um, you know it would probably uh, receive skepticism from 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 a lot of our viewers. Can you talk about that? Which program was that? You experience? Oh, at the University of Utah. The, yeah, the 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 unbundling model. The, the, there was the the uh, the, the company that. Uh, brought remote learners together in a hotel. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I was thinking of something else. Yeah, yeah. So at the beginning of COVID, we all know that the higher education industry was hugely disrupted because as we talked about, part of the business model of colleges has been selling students on this all inclusive experience, which is um, you have to be on campus, you have to be available to sit in the coffee shop, you have to be engaged in on campus events for college to really have the value that we, we tell you it has. Um, when COVID happened, colleges had to go quickly online for practical reasons. Interestingly, they started charging the same, they kept charging the same prices for the most part. And students um, were kind of wondering like, hey, wait a minute, you told me that part of the deal was all this on-campus in-person stuff. And now I don't get it, but you're charging me the same price. Um, so anyway, colleges were kind of put up, put up against the wall in that instance. Um, but there was a really clever um, entrepreneurial effort um, by some young guys who decided, you know what, that that college experience or the in-person college experience was really valuable to us. And so we want to recreate it for the people who are missing out on it through COVID. And so they rented some hotel properties and uh, filled them with students who were studying remotely and created an on-campus remote environment. And I thought it was really exciting. And I included it in the book because, you know, I think I think the unbundling of the college experience, taking the education apart from that on-campus, more squishy aspect of it, I think that may be the future. And, and I thought these guys were really on to something, which was, you know, stripping away the social aspect from the education and letting someone mix and match the pieces to best meet their needs. So um, time will tell if, if that company 
is going to survive. They, they had, they, they sort of had the odds against them um, trying to put together a business like that in the midst of a pandemic, but uh, maybe it was an opportunity that will allow them to take hold. We'll see. Do you, do you think that uh, COVID will, uh, that the lasting impact of COVID will be an acceleration of this kind of disruption that uh, more and more people will, will be learning remotely? Or do you think uh, young people will still be seeking that in-person kind of social experience and tra transition to independence and adulthood? I think it's going to be a mix. I mean, I'm thrilled that COVID forced institutions to get online so that they now have the capability to do that. I mean, a lot of students, disabled students, for instance, love that they could study remotely. They've been trying to get access to remote lectures for a long time, and, and now it magically happened. So I think there's a lot of good that can come from that. I'm optimistic that the silver lining in this is that consumers will be a bit more discriminating um, with their institutions and what they're willing to pay. So like I said, there was all of these students who were paying full freight to, to take classes from their parents' basement. And I think it really caused a lot of them to start to question, what am I really paying for? And is every penny I'm spending worth it? And is there a different path that would be more economical. And that's not good news for the colleges because, because they've been kind of getting away with selling this package of goods, a very expensive package of goods. Um, and if consumers are starting to question that, you know, it can only push them to offer more or more different options to, to break things apart so that there may be um, less luxurious pathways through their college. And yeah, I, I'm excited. I think that I believe that the consumer in this space is going to force change at institutions because as we know them, um, colleges and universities are, are not these rapid innovators that I, I wish they would be. <laughs> Any any memories of uh, you Albany that you'd like to share as a as a final as a way to close the conversation? Oh, I mean, I many. I I spend most of my my social hours participating on the crew team at Albany. So um, it was it was basically either rowing or sitting in the library. But I had the most fantastic mentors in the econ department. They must have thought I was crazy when I walked in my sophomore year and said that I was going to get an econ PhD because they knew better than I did that I had no idea what I was talking about, but I had so many folks stand up and just hold my hand through the process. And I'm so grateful for the education I was able to get there. The book is Making College Pay. An Economist Explains How to Make a Smart Bet on Higher Education. It's available for purchase from an indie bookstore via link on this screen. Thank you so much, Beth Akers. Thank you, Mark. Let me remind you that this and all our author interviews are posted on the Writers Institute's YouTube channel, and you can find them at the conversation on our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. To our audience, thanks so much for tuning in. Be well. <laughs>